Good morning. Uh, I'm Robert Summercrass, Dean of the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. Uh, welcome always to our uh, Terry Third Thursday speaker series and the Terry Executive Education Center we have here in Buckhead. Um, if you haven't been up to the third floor recently, um, you should take a look. Uh, we are building out another classroom, some offices, some additional student space, and it's all because we've got such a, a growing demand for our programs here in, in Atlanta. Um, we have some dedicated volunteers for our alumni board who make this speaker series a success each month. And we also enjoy the support of uh, some generous uh, sponsors. So I want to recognize a, a couple of those. And first is our primary corporate sponsor, the Bank of North Georgia. Um, do we have any uh, folks from Bank of North Georgia with us today? Yes. So thank you very much for your support. Uh, we also have media sponsors in Public Broadcasting Atlanta and Atlanta Business Chronicle. Can I have our sponsors uh, raise their hand so that uh, we can thank you for that? Uh, we also uh, occasionally will have students come to these breakfast meetings, and I'd like to recognize uh, a couple of them that I know are here and maybe some others that are here that I don't know about. Uh, Barrett Brooks is with us today. Uh, Barrett is one of the uh, students selected for the Deer Run Fellows program, which will be taking place in the fall, uh, part of the program that uh, Doug Ivester got started for us. Uh, we also have uh, Gina DiCamillo. Uh, she's one of our Terry ambassadors, and she helps us with some of these programs. Um, are there other students with us today? Okay, well, uh, Welcome, Gina. Welcome, Barrett. We're, we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, let me mention briefly some of our upcoming programs. Uh, in August, on the 19th, we're going to have Commissioner of Georgia's Department of Economic Development, uh, Ken Stewart. He'll be our speaker, and as uh, Commissioner, Stewart's role is really the Chief Marketing Officer for the state of Georgia. So next month, he'll be talking about some of the state's efforts to promote business growth, to increase tourism, and to promote international trade. Uh, coming up in the fall, uh, we've got Gina Drosis. She is president of Global Personal Beauty. Uh, Global Personal Beauty is Procter & Gamble's fast-growing skincare business, uh, and Gina will tell us a little bit about that business when she's here in September. Uh, the chairman of the Georgia Ports Authority will be our speaker the next month. That's Steve Green. Some of you may know him. Uh, and as most of you know, uh, Georgia has the fastest growing port system in the country. Uh, Savannah is currently ranked uh, number four in the nation in terms of volume. And Steve will share some of his plans to keep our ports growing. Now let me uh, turn to introducing our speaker, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg is uh, preeminent in the names in public health service. He spent 20 years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, he's led the CDC's work in violence prevention and later became the first permanent director of the National Center for in Injury Prevention and Control. He's also held the position of Special Assistant for Behavioral Science in the Office of the Deputy Director. His early work with CDC included a smallpox eradication effort, uh, enteric diseases, and HIV AIDS. Mark is a member of the, the boards of directors for the American Suicide Foundation and the National Safety Council. He's also a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior and co-editor-in-chief for Injury Control and Safety Promotion. Dr. Rosenberg is board certified in psychiatry and internal medicine with training in public policy. He earned his undergraduate degree as well as degrees in public policy and medicine at Harvard University. Mark is on the faculty at Morehouse Medical School, Emory Medical School, and Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. He's authored more than 120 scientific publications and received the Sur Surgeon General's Exemplary Service Medal and multiple commendations from the U.S. Health Service, including the Meritorious Service Medal, Distinguished Service Medal, and Outstanding Service Medal. He is now President and CEO of the Task Force for Global Health, an organization committed to several collaborative ventures, 
including injury control and violence prevention. Partners of the Task Force for Global Health include UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, as well as the World Bank. Dr. Rosenberg is here this morning to talk about real collaboration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosenberg. Thanks, Robert. Well, good morning. It's not going to be as stuffy as that made it sound. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited to be here today. And that, there are a couple things I want to talk with you about. One is global health. It's a world that Kim, my colleague, Kim Estes, and myself and our organization live in every day. And it's a world that's very different from global beauty. It's a world that's very different from the business that we do every day here in Atlanta or Athens or Gwinnett. But it strikes me part of what we can learn is about each other's worlds. Because I think this world of global health has so many opportunities and needs the skills that you have in business so badly. There's so much need and so much potential in this area so that uh, I'm excited just to share with you some parts of this world in which we work. And I want to tell you about the Task Force for Global Health because I think it's an unusual organization. And uh, in doing so, we'll tell you a little bit about this issue of collaboration and working things out with partners. So these are the things I'd like to cover. And uh, I picked the title here, The Secrets, because I think there are a few secrets. And I think you have in front of you a paper with a blue arrow. Let me get it. Thanks. It looks like this. And I would just tell you at the beginning, don't leave this behind at the table because this has the secrets, and we'll talk about this <laughs> on it right there. Let me tell you a little bit about the task force. Um, in 1984, Bill Fage, who was the director of CDC and the man who had been responsible for the eradication of smallpox, it's the only disease that's ever been eradicated, and he was the person who was largely responsible for this. Um, he was the director of CDC, and he left CDC. And people told him, you shouldn't leave. He was the most beloved director CDC has ever had. They said, if you leave here, this is the most effective platform for global health in the world. If you leave here, you're going to throw away your career. You'll never achieve anything of significance again. Don't go. And he thought about it, and he left. <laughs> and he was working with President Carter, and they were looking for some gaps in the world that they might close. And they found this gap. And what they found was that if you looked at developed countries like our country or England or Scandinavia, almost all of the kids were immunized against these common diseases of childhood. But if you looked at the developing world, it was 20%, only 20%. And they said, my gosh, this is a gap. He said, if we could close this gap, if we could immunize 80% of the kids in the developing world, in the poor countries, we could save the lives of 3,000 children a day. 3,000 children a day. So he went to the organizations that were doing this. And there were two big organizations who were doing it. One was a World Health Organization based in Geneva, and the other was UNICEF based in New York. And he went to them and he said, why don't we work to close this gap? And they said, you don't understand. He said, oh, I think I do. He said, it's the same kind of vaccine that they need that we have. It's the same kind of needles that you'd use and they have the same kind of arms that we have. Why can't we just close this gap? And they said, you just don't get it, do you? 
They said, you know, we've been doing this for years and years. We raised $35 million a year. We know the countries. We know the players. We know the donors. Believe us, it doesn't get any better than this. This is as good as it gets. And he stepped back and he said, my gosh, the problem really is that these two organizations are competing with each other. They're competing for donors. They're competing for success. They're competing for which countries they could work in. He said, what if we could get them to work together rather than compete with each other? So he went back to them and he said, look, I bet if we work together, we could do this. He said, I bet if we work together, we could raise $100 million. And he said, I bet we could raise that level and close this gap. And they looked at him and they said, we think you're crazy. But they agreed to do it. So he got these two organizations to agree to work together. And he got the World Bank and the Rockefeller Foundation and the UN Development Program. These five organizations agreed to work together. And they called themselves the Task Force for Child Survival, 1984. They agreed to work together. And the task force was really the secretariat to help these people collaborate and work effectively together. The first year, they raised $100 million. The second year, they raised $200 million. And by six years, they had raised a $1 billion. And these five organizations working together with a task force as the secretariat raised the immunization levels of children in the developing country up to 80% in six years. And Jim Grant, who was the head of UNICEF, called this the largest peacetime mobilization in history. It was really an extraordinary accomplishment. And it was accomplished by bringing people together and bringing organizations to work together and to collaborate. Bill Fagy was the master of this. He's really good at it. In part, he said, we need to make it work because we're going to shed all the light on these organizations. And we, here in Atlanta, will be invisible. We'll give all the credit to our partners. He said, this is part of getting people to work together effectively. They want credit. They need credit for their organizations. And they did that so well that you have probably never heard of the task force. <laughs> Most people have never heard of the task force because this was actually part of the strategy, shine the light on your partners. It was very, very successful. This is a picture of Bill Fagy, who was the former director of CDC, the man responsible for the eradication of smallpox. He would never tell you that. If you asked him, he's writing a book now about the eradication of smallpox in India. If you asked him who was responsible for this, he would say it's very clear. It's the Indian people. It's the Indian people. When he got to India in 1973, there were 82,000 cases of smallpox, 82,000 outbreaks. And the Minister of Health for India looked at the map with Bill Fagy. And Bill Fagy looked at the map with all these cases around it. And Bill Fagy said, well, it's depressing, but it's not hopeless. But the Minister of Health for India, being a good Hindu, said, no, it's hopeless, but that's not depressing. So Bill Fagy <laughs> started out with thousands and thousands and thousands of cases. And within two years, he had a method of containing these cases. And it was clear that they were going to eradicate them. And he called his boss. And he said, I'm coming home. And his boss, the director of CDC, said, absolutely not. He said, don't you get it? Don't you understand? In six months, there will be zero cases in India. This is an unheard of accomplishment eradicating smallpox from this country where people thought it could never be done. He said in six months, there's going to be the biggest celebration the world has ever seen. The world of global health has never had an accomplishment like this. 
you've got to stay there. And Bill Feige said, no, boss, I understand. But you see, if I'm here, all the attention and all the credit will be focused on the foreigners. And this is an accomplishment of the Indian people, and they've got to get the credit, and I'm coming home. Bill calls this ego suppression, shining the light on your partners. It's very, very important to make a coalition work. He left the task force around 2000 to go work with Bill Gates and help Bill Gates start the Gates Foundation and help them focus on global health. In 1987, a second opportunity came to the task force. And it arose when the CEO of Merck, the pharmaceutical company, came to the task force and came to Bill Feige and they said, look, there's this disease called river blindness. It's caused by the bite of a small black fly. This black fly lives on the fast flowing rivers, mostly in West Africa. And when it bites you, it injects this little parasite called Oncocerca into your skin, and the parasite multiplies and reproduces, and it causes the most intense inflammatory response, horrendous itching. It drives you crazy, and eventually the little parasites get into your eye and cause the same sort of intense inflammatory response in your eye, and it leads to blindness. So that in huge parts of West Africa, because of river blindness, all the old men were blind, old being over 40. And they couldn't farm. They couldn't work. And the young boys had to lead them around by a stick. And they couldn't go to school. It devastated the economy. It devastated families. It was a devastating disease. And it affected millions and millions of people. And the CEO of Merck came to Bill Feige and said, we have this drug called Mectazan. If you have a dog, do any of you have dogs and you give your dog heart guard? That's Mectazan. And the CEO said, we sell so much of this to the veterinary population that we make enough profit. We're never going to make much money by charging poor people in Africa. We'll give this away. We'll give you as much of this as you need to fight river blindness for as long as you need it. It was an extraordinary offer, an extraordinary offer. So Bill Feige went to his colleagues at the task force and said, look, we have this incredible offer. Should we do this? And they were unified in the response. They went back to him and they said, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. No, don't do this. He said, why? They said, don't you realize that Merck is big pharma? Big pharma works for profit. They do bad things. They make profit from people's illness. If you, who are good, and you're working in public health and global health, you're trying to do good in the world, if you associate yourself with big pharma, you'll dirty the name of the task force. You'll dirty your own name. Worse, you'll dirty our name. We don't want any part of this. You need to go back and tell them no. So Bill Feige went back. He went to a meeting with the CEO at Merck. And again, the CEO made this offer and said, do you want to take this drug as much as you need for as long as you need it? And Bill said, let me go talk to my people. He had brought three or four of his advisors. They were sitting out in the waiting area. And again, they said no. And he went back in, and Bill said, yeah. <laughs> yes, we'll do this. Because he saw what might happen. He saw the good that could happen. And the task force agreed that we would distribute this drug through ministries of health to non-governmental organizations and nonprofits. And we started the program. We have now distributed more than 800 million treatments and huge areas of West Africa that had been abandoned. The most fertile areas, the areas by the fast flowing rivers, had the worst river blindness. 
and people had to move out. They moved away. It was devastating. Now river blindness is being controlled in huge areas. That's a lot of cases of blindness that have been prevented. 800 million treatments and growing. It's been an incredibly successful program. This has now been the precedent for what we call pharmacophilanthropy, where different pharmaceutical companies make really amazing contributions to the health of the poorest people around the world. So that now the task force has similar partnerships with Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson donate 100 million tablets of mebendazole that's used to treat children who have intestinal parasites. It's incredibly effective, this medicine. GlaxoSmithKline donates albendazole, which is used with mectazan to treat elephantiasis. This is a disease, a mosquito bites you, it injects parasites that block your lymph glands, and so the fluids can't get returned back up to your heart. You've probably seen pictures of elephantiasis, people with hugely swollen limbs, arms, legs, hugely swollen, and now there's a treatment that prevents this, prevents this. Pfizer donates to the task force a drug called Zithromax that's used to prevent trachoma, the leading cause of infectious blindness around the world. Trachoma we know here in this country because it's caused by chlamydia that usually is associated with sexually transmitted diseases. But in Africa and parts of Asia where people are so poor they don't have water, young children don't have water to wash their face. And so all the secretions from their eye, from their nose, from their mouth, from their food accumulate on their face and flies come and land on them. And here if a fly lands on a child, what do they do? It's annoying. They do what we do. But there you see children with 12 or 14 flies on their face and because it's hopeless, they don't even swat them off. These flies land on them and these flies transmit chlamydia. It's a bacteria that gets in their eyes and over time it stays in their eyes. It causes an infection and the inside of your eyelid gets scarred and contracts and shrinks and your eyelashes, instead of protecting you, turn in and start to scratch your cornea. And every time you blink, they scratch your cornea. If you've ever had it, there's no one here who's never had a speck of dirt in your eye, and you know how painful that is. If you have contact lenses, you really know how painful that is. And that's what happens. The eyelashes turn in, and eventually it scars the cornea, and they become blind millions and millions of people. And Pfizer now donates more than a billion dollars worth of Zithromax each year to the task force that we distribute and are actually attempting to eliminate blinding trachoma by the year 2020. These are diseases called the neglected tropical diseases. They're neglected because they affect the poorest of the poor. We don't hear about them. We don't know about them. They're not AIDS, TB, or malaria. They don't usually result in death, but they result in horrible disfigurement and pain and blindness. And these are diseases that we think we can start to eliminate and in some places eradicate completely with the treatments that we have. The task force now has several of these large drug donation programs with the neglected tropical diseases. And our budget next year is about $1.5 billion. And you still haven't heard of us. You still don't know that we're here in Atlanta. But again, we're continuing to try to do good things in the work that we do. One of the secrets of our success has been that we bring different organizations together and try to get people and organizations to collaborate. Now, it's hard to tell people that you have some secrets for collaboration because everybody thinks that they're good at it. We all think we know how to do it. We've survived this far in life. Clearly, we couldn't get here without partners or collaboration. There's nothing you need to teach us about it. But uh, I love this quote from 
Yogi Berra. He's from my hometown, Montclair, New Jersey, and he received a degree at Montclair State College, an honorary doctorate, and when he received the degree, he said this. He said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're not. In theory, we're all good at collaboration. In practice, we're not. And I think about forming coalitions, the type of coalition that the task force formed. Bill Feige, again, was the master at this. But I think about coalitions very much like a marriage. It's very easy to get into it. And it's very hard to make it work. Is there anyone here who's married or has a partner? You know that we tell people in public, oh, it's easy. We're really happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I've stopped asking people, is there anyone who doesn't think it's hard? Because we have a different public and private sense. In theory, yes, it's easy. She's good. I'm good. It, we make it work. In practice, it's really, really hard to make a partnership work. And it takes work. And it takes work every single day. And you can't work on it one week and then have two weeks of a free ride. It doesn't work like that. And it's the same in coalitions. They're hard to make them work. And there are a number of barriers to this. And a colleague of mine, Jim Austin, a wonderful professor, now retired from Harvard Business School, um, developed what he called the seven C's. Why don't collaborations work more often? What are the barriers? And the first one, he says, is culture. You know, this culture of Bill Feige and his staff between global health and private industry, where they said, no, you can't have anything to do with them. We're good, they're bad. That's one type of cultural difference. But there are other cultural differences. In Africa, they speak different languages. In Africa, many people are incredibly poor. In Asia, they have multiple languages. How do we bridge these cultural gaps? But differences in culture, differences in expectations are part of the problem here. The second conflict here is really conflicting goals. People want different things out of a partnership. They want different things. And it's not so much that people necessarily want different goals. UNICEF and the World Health Organization want different things. They want credit. <laughs> they wanted credit. And they wanted money. They needed to raise money. And they wanted to take credit for a different set of countries. But even with initially conflicting goals, they were able to say, hey, but what really drives us is saving the lives of 3,000 children a day, getting the levels to 80%. And the trick here is if you can get a common overriding goal that's bigger than your individual goals, that can hold you together. That's so important to have a common overriding goal. The third problem is confusion about roles and responsibilities and organizational goals. And what happens usually is we say, oh, let's build this coalition. UGA is going to collaborate with, oh my gosh, Georgia State? And we're going to collaborate with Emory School of Business? Yikes. This is going to be trouble. Let's at least let's just see if we can get them at the table. The governor wants us to come together. He wants us to work out a common approach. Let's not worry about what our role is going to be or what their role is going to be. Let's just get them to the table. And that's where we stop. And this is the most fatal mistake of most partnerships and coalitions. There's confusion about the roles and responsibilities because we think it's too hard to work these out in the beginning. And we say, oh, we'll get to those later. We'll work this out later. You have to work it out and clarify the confusion early on at the beginning. Control. Nobody wants to give it up, whether it's in a marriage or it's in a coalition or a partnership. Everyone struggles for control because we somehow think, well, if we don't have a lot of resources, at least we have control over the process. And I have to go back and report to my chancellor that UGA is in charge. 
I mean, we are Georgia. We've got to be in control. And that really prevents effective collaboration very frequently, very commonly. The capabilities, people come with different skills and talents, and yet sometimes we think, oh my gosh, I'm the husband. I'm good at everything. I'm in charge of everything. At least we have to present this front to the world. I have to be in charge of the finances. I have to make all the important decisions. I have to bring home the money. I have to be the best all around. And in truth, no one is. No one has all the skills that you need. And the value of a partnership or a collaboration is that you benefit from the different complementary skills that different people bring. Competition, who's the best, who's the biggest, who's got the most, who's gonna win this? UNICEF and WHO, who's gonna get credit for this? Which organization is gonna be in the headlines? We need to beat them. Again, this is something you need to overcome, and it's a potential barrier, but it doesn't have to be a real barrier. And then costs. Frequently, we're not very realistic about what things are going to cost, but to form a collaboration, to form a coalition, to form a partnership means you have to put something into it. We all know that to manage our own business, it takes an effort, it takes time, it takes attention. But we think, oh, a coalition, a partnership, that doesn't need any management. Boy, if you're learning management skills, if you're learning management skills at the Terry College, that is so important. And you know that good management takes resources. It takes time and it takes attention. All of these are the potential barriers to effective collaboration. In global health, when we don't collaborate, we impose an incredible burden on the countries that we're trying to work with and the countries we're trying to help. This is just one country, Tanzania, and it shows all the different organizations, 40 or 50 organizations that have AIDS programs in Tanzania. Each of these programs swamps the Minister of Health. Each of them has their own requirements, their own money, they demand their own meeting with the ministry. If they don't collaborate, they impose an insufferable burden on the country. We don't always look at that. Here's the last slide here. And it's really that slide that you have in front of you. And it's looking at the framework for successful collaborations. We interviewed lots of people and lots of organizations working in global health. And what we found are there are certain problems that they run into, but there are also certain tricks that can help you succeed. And we found it's useful to divide a collaboration or a partnership or a coalition into three phases. The first mile, the journey, and the last mile. The first mile is when you come together and you look at that last mile and you say, ah, that's our goal. That's where we're going to go. That's where we want to get to. So you form and you clarify that goal and you hash it out and you pound it out and you get agreement and you are very clear on what that final goal is going to be. You also develop your strategy in that first mile. How are we gonna get there? How are we gonna make this thing work? Who's gonna do what? How will we be organized? What's the structure that we're gonna form? We can't be an amorphous coalition. We need some people to be in charge of some things and we need to make sure we're getting done what we need to do. And who will be the members of our organization or coalition? These are the main challenges for the first mile. Then there's that journey. We're actually working towards the last mile. That's where you need shared leadership. Oftentimes you have multiple leaders and they bring multiple skills. One person may be a wonderful fundraiser, one person may be a wonderful administrator or manager, another may be the visionary who can go out and get people excited about what you're going to do. But you need that leadership, you need the social capital. For this journey, you need to create a sense of trust and openness and transparency among people. You can't work well together if there's not trust 
and it takes attention to the personal relationships and the dynamics. And finally, effective project management. You need to manage what you're doing, even in a partnership or a coalition, is probably more important than in a single organization. Then there's the last mile. When you've got there, you wrap things up, and you finish, and you're done. And partnerships have a lifespan. They don't go on forever. They don't last forever. A lot of organizations like UNICEF and the World Health Organization have what we call subprime partnerships. So many, so many that should have ended in the past. We've tried to put together some of what we've learned in a book called Real Collaboration. And it, it has a lot of explanation about the tools. There's a toolkit in there. We think it will be useful for you. And we think it's written so it's not a textbook to sit on the shelf, but it's a guide for the kind of partnerships I suspect all of you probably want to create or need to create or already have but may not be working. And we hope it's useful. Again, the, the task force is working in this world of global health. A lot of the secrets we have discovered, a lot of the tricks we have learned for effective partnerships and coalitions are in this book. We think it's more broadly useful. We think it's useful to bridge this world of business and the health of the poorest of the poor. There's such a need to do that, and there's so much potential if we can work effectively together. Let me stop here and see if you have questions. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, now, uh, let me just uh, remind people that we are podcasting this. We're making a recording of it, and this is also a very wide room. So if you've got a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring you a microphone, and that way everybody will be able to, uh, to hear you. So um, any questions? Thank you so much. Most interesting. Recently, um, in the last week or so, we've been hearing more and more about the dysfunctional aspects of aid to Haiti. And I'm wondering how uh, an organization like yours looks at that kind of crisis management that, that, that wherever it wants to cooperate, but it uh, must be much more difficult than usual. Haiti is a really difficult situation because to have effective coalitions, you need a place for people to come together. And Haiti lost the presidential palace. They lost even the place to come together to meet. And it's been a really difficult situation. CDC here in Atlanta is taking the lead in putting together a response, trying to work with the Ministry of Health in Haiti. Again, these are things you don't hear about every day. But CDC is working to get a building for the Ministry of Health. And it's a portable building that will be donated with funds that CDC is able to raise, where people can meet and start to come together mm -hmm. and organize their effort. But I think part of what we've seen in Haiti is that a disaster of that level mobilizes an immediate response of multiple organizations but when there's no one coordinating them and there's no natural type of collaboration among them, sometimes the efforts are duplicative at best and interfere with each other at the worst. So it's been a difficult situation. And uh, I think they're doing more and more. Three weeks ago, I met with the Minister of Health from Haiti. And we talked about this project to try to organize uh, a common response, not just to the immediate disaster, but it's really an issue of long-term development. And CDC now is looking at trying to organize all the organizations in Atlanta that might be interested in collaborating in long-term aid to Haiti. So there's clearly a role and clearly a need for that kind of collaboration there. But in an emergency, sometimes it's hard to get it together. Yeah. I'm actually 
very pleasantly surprised by this presentation. It has a lot of applications to business, and I didn't think before I got here it would, so that was very interesting. Um, but I'm interested to uh, hear your thoughts on um, what, if there's been any correlation between you all being able to eradicate some of these things, and particularly like the blindness to some improvement in the economic situation of these poorest of the poor in our world. It's a wonderful question, and there are tremendous connections to the economic productivity. With river blindness, these areas, the most fertile areas in West Africa, were essentially abandoned because people realized that if we live there, if we stay there, we'll go blind. Our lives will be cut off. Now, with treatment and prevention of blindness, Huge areas have been resettled, and people are farming the most fertile areas again. The productivity has been in the billions and billions of dollars in the estimates from these treatments. And it, again, if you think back, here's billions of dollars of lives improved because someone had the vision to say, let's donate this. And someone else had the vision to say, let's distribute this. So that sometimes having the vision to see the benefits that could be derived makes an incredible difference in treating probably the most widespread of these neglected tropical diseases are the intestinal infections of young children. they are worms that get into the children by um, some through their skin, by walking in areas where people don't have latrines or bathrooms. They get reinfected with these pinworms or hookworms or intestinal parasites. And a single treatment once a year can prevent this. They did a study at the MIT Poverty Action Lab, and they found that a lot of children in Africa were not learning very well in school because they were starting slow. They didn't have enough support at home. And so they got children tutors and they gave them special attention, kind of like our Head Start or preschool programs to get kids school ready. And they did this there, and they found that for about $5,000 a year per child, the child got a big boost in their school productivity and what they learned. Well, children who are infected with parasites, the parasites frequently cause a lowering of your blood level because the parasites take your blood. Children don't get enough oxygen to their brain because their blood capacity is low, they're anemic, and they can't stay awake and they can't learn. So they compared, they said, what if we give these children mebendazole? We'll give them two tablets once a year and the cost is $1.50 and we'll compare how much this improves their educational performance with a $1.50 investment with a $5,000 investment in extra tutoring. So at MIT, they did this randomized control trial. And guess what they found? Which do you think was more effective, the $1.50 or the $5,000? the $1.50 was many times more effective in improving educational performance. Frequently, this means young children who can learn to grow up and get skills and become economically productive. The economic impact of some of the cheapest interventions, $1.50 per child per year, gives them a tremendous head start, a tremendous advantage. A dollar fifty per person per year can prevent river blindness. Fifty cents per person per year can prevent elephantiasis. People with elephantiasis can't work. They are frequently so stigmatized. If you have a swollen, a massively swollen leg, you're afraid to go out in public. You don't go to your job. You have thousands and tens of thousands of millions of people who can't work. And for 50 cents, for 50 cents, you can prevent this. The treatments for elephantiasis, lymphatic filariasis is a technical name, or LF, the treatments are so cheap. This past year, we helped distribute treatments to more than 
600 million people. Talk about economic benefits in the world. And again, you're talking about the interaction of business and global health. Global health needs you. Global health needs the very skills that you have. We were talking about this before. Probably Bill Fagy said that the most important need in global health is for good management, good management skills. And that's what you produce. That's what you teach. That's what you know. There's such a need for this partnership. And again, the potential is so great. Mark, you uh, talked a lot about um, the, uh, the task force and its role in controlling disease in, in poor parts of the world, but you also talked a little bit about uh, a role you apparently have with the uh, disaster in Haiti. And so I'm wondering, um, you gave us some advice on how to form a good collaboration. Uh, can you give us some advice on how you select the problems that you tackle? because it just seems like there are so many different problems that you could be tackling that you couldn't possibly have the resources for all of them. So how do you decide what to do next? Um, it's a really good question. In part, the task force grew when people came to us and said, we think we have a solution. We have this drug, Mectazan, that can prevent river blindness, or we have Zithromax that can prevent trachoma or we have albendazole or mebendazole. So we've grown in part opportunistically when people came to us. And I think now we've taken another tool from business, which is strategic planning. And we're starting to say, we suspect that there are opportunities in Atlanta working with additional companies to form effective partnerships, to go overseas, to reach these people who might not otherwise be reached. So we're trying to be much more strategic and pick ways that we can build on the skills and the skill sets that we have. Part of the reason that we try to put these secrets together, this is the book, and I think there's a brochure on your table. Um, I can also tell you that we make no royalties from this book. And the only real value to us in the book is if it's helpful to you, if it's useful in building business coalitions or partnerships. Um, we think it reads really well. We think it's useful for people who don't even work in the area of global health. But we're looking for partnerships where we can take our skills and our experience and maybe build in a, a strategic way. Maybe a partnership is with UGA and the Terry College of Business to try to say, how can we develop a business track together that meets the needs for global health in developing countries. The poorest of the poor, when we talk about the bottom billion, we're talking about a market of a billion people. It's a different market than the market we have for most of our products here, because here we usually think, who can buy this? Who can we sell it to? But remember when Roy Vagelos, the CEO of Merck, came with Mechdazam. He said, we think there's a market out there for this drug. It's not a market where we're going to sell it, but it's hundreds of millions of people who need this. So one of our hopes in terms of helping is that you will have ideas or thoughts for ways that products or services or skills or training can reach new markets, and we may be able to help you reach those markets. At least we're interested in talking with you about it or thinking it through and how we can do it. There is in the back of this book a DVD in the back of every copy. And on that DVD, there is a film about collaboration in global health that was made by Richard Stanley, an extraordinary filmmaker. It's really compelling. It's really good. It shows you some of the value of collaboration and some of the obstacles. And it stars Bill Fagy. So you get to hear a little bit about this founder who's really an extraordinary person in global health. But I think the opportunities to work together are really there. 
We have some extra copies of the DVD here with us this morning, if some of you are interested in the toolkit or, or seeing that film. But uh, our hope is that even though we're not going to shine the light on the task force, uh, and I still think we want to shine the light on our partners, we're trying to let people know that the task force is here and that the task force is a resource for those of you who want to start to think globally about reaching these new markets. Hi. Um, you noted that um, you try not to shine the light on task force. Do you see that that inhibits your ability to fundraise without sort of strong name recognition? So people have to know who you are to give you money. <laughs> um, we should ask Kim, who has taken on the extraordinary challenge of how do you raise funds? Um, we we think we have an ability to help people in a very significant way. And the real challenge is exactly, as you said, if we don't shine the light on the task force, if people who are even our neighbors in Decatur and Atlanta don't know we're here, then it's very hard to approach people and say, are you interested in supporting this good work? So we're trying to let people know we are here. We're trying to let people know that we do good things and that there's tremendous potential to help many, many people. So we just finished our first capital, we're finishing up our first capital campaign. We have a building now in Decatur and would invite any of you to come visit us um, in Decatur. And we're on the web, you can find us under taskforce.org. And we're starting to think, how do we fundraise? How do we let people know that we're here and what we're doing? And I think Kim has been a wonderful resource. We have, I think, put on your tables a insert from the Emory report um, that talks a little bit about some of the work that we do. And you have that. And we have some other materials if you're interested in it. But it, you put your finger on a really hard challenge. Okay, well, Mark, thank you very much for a very interesting thank you. presentation. Uh, and from our uh, alumni board and on behalf of the Terry College, let me uh, present you with this glass thank sculpture you. from thank you local very much. artist uh, Loretta Eby. Uh, this concludes our. Uh, Terry Third Thursday this month. Uh, remember, as you're leaving, to mention that you are Terry Third Thursday. That'll get you out of the parking deck. So uh, have a good day, and we'll see you next month.